Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos in our group reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. In this 14th lecture, we will move on to the phase dealing with the Night of Virtue and the Way of the World. This is the third and final phase within a triad of active reason. And um, we'll actually finish that out today. And in the next video, we get to move on to a whole new set of phases within reason before, of course, moving on finally to spirit. And of course, we are doing this as part of a challenge where the members of the School of Forbidden Texts have accepted to do about two videos per week. I think we could increase that maybe to three videos per week, um, starting after next week. Next week, I had something come up where I've got to uh, write a submission for a collection of essays to be uh, part of a book on um, a, a sort of philosophical topic. I just found out about that basically like yesterday. So um, maybe not next week we'll do three, but perhaps the week after that we will. And um, it might sound like a lot, but uh, the sections you might have noticed are becoming shorter and shorter. And um, this is definitely something which I think we should be doing because really you're not going to be able to do this anywhere else. I've mentioned several times before that um, the academic industry not only is not teaching Hegel, they're certainly not doing that. As I've mentioned before, um, you'd be lucky even to hear the slave master dialectic referenced in relation to Marx and teach will assure you there's nothing there to read anyway. You're certainly not going to uh, read this entire book, despite the fact that it is arguably the greatest work in the history of Western philosophy. I know that um, last year I, I put it at least within the top three. Now that I'm actually going through it once again, I might even venture to say this is like number one. So the academic industry is um, in a very strange position where, you know, they're charging you $100,000 in debt and not even showing you a sentence from the greatest work of Western philosophy. But this should not come as so great a surprise, because if you actually work for the academic industry, as I have in the past, you realize that at this point, the business model is one that does not include teaching anything whatsoever. Now, when they're recruiting you as a prospective um, student loan borrower, and we call that a student, but what you really are is someone um, agreeing to take on predatory loans for the rest of your life, um, they, they tell you things like, well, we're um, giving you the skills to work the jobs of the future. We're giving you an education to set you apart from the uneducated masses to have any life that you desire. You know, that you look into the mirror like they had for Harry Potter that shows you what you want to see, even if it's not real. Um, they tell you that they're selling you the education and skills to give you a high paying, meaningful and fulfilling career of your choice. But, um, when you actually work for them, they tell you something very different. And remember my final interview ever to be a poorly paid adjunct at a joke of a two-year nursing school, basically where you get certified to be like a CNA or something like that. Um, and I remember um, in the interview, the um, chair of the department kind of had this awkward moment where he's like, well, you know, we don't really teach content anymore. That's an old, outdated view of education. We realize now as enlightened academic careerists and student loan salesmen that uh, the purpose of college is just to teach life skills. <laughs> well, what the fuck are life skills except um, just the, um, the ways of the aristocracy, which you are basically paying $100,000 in debt for a very expensive book of manners to act the way that rich people do. Um, and they're literally saying that you're going $100,000 in debt for nothing. So you could do that, or you could do the real thing and join the School for Bin Texts um, for the price of just one cup of coffee at Starbucks. So uh, we'll go ahead now and get back into the text. Thank you so much. All right, so this final stage of active reason really finishes out a long process that um, had begun, as you might recall, with Faust quite literally selling his soul to the devil in order to elevate the pleasure of the individual over the universal law. Um, now, at the end of that procedure, we realize in direct contrast with that first phase that we must now instead devote a whole phase of the phenomenology to the project of negating that individual uh, by having him or her submit totally to the law. No longer the pseudo law of really the individual himself, as we saw in last section, the law of the heart, which was no law at all. Now the individual is really going to surrender to the discipline of the universal, as he calls it in paragraph 381. And the word for this discipline of the universal is, of course, 
virtue. Whereas the law of the heart fought to impose his own arbitrary moralistic demands on everyone else, which they were supposed to accept for no reason except that they're mine, the knight of virtue now does the exact opposite of that. He fights a holy war against all selfishness, even his own selfishness, in favor of a virtue which is not any one particular heart's invention or even any one heart's possession, but is simply an objective good in itself. Virtue is now recognized as the essence which endures even after all the irrelevant noise of accidental bodily existence is filtered out. The name for this latter stuff, which must be actively opposed, that is to say the um, materiality of existence which contaminates the purity of virtue, well, the word for that stuff is just the way of the world. In a certain sense, virtue can reliably be identified through the negative formula of that which is not such self-interest as I just described. Hopeless as it might seem to rid the entire world of such self-interest, the knight of virtue assures us that this can be done, provided one invests enough personal effort into it. Now, if we briefly compare these three phases of active reason, even from a purely logical perspective, um, before getting too deep into the third section as such, we'll notice a few things that are quite interesting. For example, Faust opened this triad by representing the self as an immediate singularity, which was opposed to society thought of as an immediate universal. The law of the heart, in contrast, represented the individual as itself a combination of singular and universal in one, because the individual was understood to be a composite of both heart and law. The world on the outside, which that um, individual had to evangelize and correct, in contrast, was viewed as an opposition of singular and universal. By the third and final phase, the night of virtue and the way of the world, however, can no longer be quite as easily distinguished from one another, even on purely logical grounds. As we shall see over the course of this section, each of them actually contains both unity and opposition at the same time. We see as early as paragraph 381, for example, that the knight is, of course, to be defined as the one who negates self-interest in order to promote the universal virtue, while the way of the world is simply defined as the negation of virtue and the promotion of self-interest. Now, if you think about that for just a moment, you'll realize that these two definitions are simply inverses of one another and are, from a strictly logical perspective, both structurally defined by the same thing, and that is a certain movement of law and individuality towards one another. By paragraph 382, we find that this mysterious way of the world, which um, the Knight of Virtue is fighting against, um, actually does have a determinate content in addition to its empty formal description as simply the inverse of the virtue which he champions. The way of the world, if you really think about it, is just the two preceding movements of consciousness which we have already encountered, as Hegel says himself explicitly near the beginning of this section. On one hand, um, the way of the world is Faust, because Faust shows us the exact opposite of virtue qua the single individuality which seeks its own pleasure and enjoyment. On the other hand, the way of the world is the law of the heart we saw in the last section because this is an individuality which claims to be law in its own right and in its own conceit disturbs the existing order something which definitely does not merit the title of virtue. Virtue, as something you only really get in the third phase, arises from out of these two preceding phases on a dialectical level, but proceeds to actively nullify its own origin in order to become for itself rather than merely in itself. This third phase, therefore, differs from the preceding two largely through recognizing two different modes of this living contradiction which will remain if you do not resolve it. If the living contradiction becomes explicitly conscious of its own conflict, then it becomes madness, as we saw near the final um, sections of the Law of Heart in the last video. But if this contradiction merely endures as an objective reality, we would call that just a perversion in general. And it's largely such a perversion of virtue 
rampant throughout the world that has not yet evolved to the phase of consciousness represented by the knight himself. It's largely that which he is going to fight against in this section. By paragraph 383, Hegel goes as far as to argue that this mysterious virtue which the knight is fighting for, which was before only partially defined as the inverse of some other thing, well, it might be better understood now as just the opposition to such perversion. This principle of perversion in itself might also be better defined as nothing more than the pathological stain of human individuality. That is exactly what stands in the way of a universal of virtue throughout the entire population. Um, it's just the uh, contingencies of your individuality and my individuality and everyone else's, which we cling to in our own self-interested refusal to submit to the discipline of the universal. The knight now understands the way of the world itself to simply be defined as the perversion of behavior by such human individuality and realizes that his job is to reverse this in order to, as I quote Hegel, make manifest the true essence, that is, the enduring universality of virtue, by removing all of the accidental noise of all of our personal contingencies. Ironically enough, the knight promises that society can indeed be thoroughly transformed into a perfectly disinterested virtuous order simply through more hard labor, which is just another way of saying more individual effort. This contradiction in which individual effort fights to rid the earth of itself is only an inevitable conclusion of the fact that the outcome of this conflict must be decided by the nature of the living weapons borne by the combatants, as I quote Hegel himself. These weapons used in the fight are, of course, not extrinsic tools like swords, spears, bow and arrow, etc. The weapons really are just the innate nature of the combatants themselves. One uses oneself, in other words, to fight against oneself. We realize by paragraph 384 that the knight does indeed have faith in the virtue which he is fighting for, but that is precisely because that is the only thing which he can do with it. He does not know this virtue as a real, concrete, or certain thing, because it is only implicitly true at this phase, because the kind of universality which it has is merely abstract. The essence of such abstract universality actually falls apart upon closer examination, for if one asks the inconvenient question, what exactly virtue is, one finds that one can only define it as that which is not the way of the world. This purely negative definition does not actually tell you anything, but only reveals virtue to be a being for an other, as I quote Hegel, something that does not have a being of its own, for otherwise it would not have to make itself true by conquering its opposite. Because such virtue is only for an other, it is an abstraction which has reality not in its own right, but only in its relation to the way of the world. By paragraph 385, we finally arrive at a positive and fully independent definition of virtue, no longer defining it merely as the inverse, the opposition to, or the negation of some other thing. At this point, we finally realize that virtue simply is the proper use of one's own talents. If you really think about it, vice also is simply the misuse of all of the gifts, capacities, and strengths which a person was endowed with. I either as a matter of happenstance or if you accept the literal meaning of the word gift as a gift from God. These are things which are not inherently bad, at, but are only corrupted through the influence of the way of the world. In fact, virtue actively requires the gifts and talents of the individual in order to be actualized in the real world. Considered this way, the night realizes that the good actively requires a principle of individuality to give it life and movement, for only in the principle of individuality excuse me, can it obtain actual existence. In this way, the Knight of Virtue has unwittingly returned to the same theory that Rousseau had championed in the previous section, for both of them agree that all hearts are naturally good and are only later corrupted by a mysterious force out there in the way of the world, which, however, becomes ever harder to define. 
By paragraph 386, this ambiguity in the meaning of the way of the world becomes an unavoidable catastrophe as the knight finally sees that the battle between virtue and vice is actually a sham fight. Both sides, he finds, are using exactly the same weapons, and these are, of course, the capacities, powers, and gifts which can be used for good or for evil purposes, depending only on the individual using them. These, he finds, are the essential content, to which virtue and vice are merely secondary accidental additions. Virtue, though, was posited at the beginning of this section as essence, but has somehow lost that status precisely as a result of the knight's fanatical fighting on its behalf. Worse yet, Hegel noted, what are risked in the fight are only the gifts and capacities which are not themselves supposed to be at issue. The knight finds that his own crusade to make the entire world absolutely virtuous is nothing more than an empty game of fencing against his own reflection in the mirror, to use Hegel's own memorable metaphor. Back there in the real world, which endures uh, uh, beyond the illusion he had got sucked into, he finds that action actually matters far more than the intent buried deep within one's heart. So much so, in fact, that he has to eventually admit that even acts which are self-interested can end up benefiting others and being good in the real world despite contradicting the knight's own hasty definition of virtue as the simple negation of self-interest given at the beginning of this section. Paragraph 386 notes that the actual good is in inextricably interwoven with every manifestation of the way of the world. Virtue is not a remainder which persists after the total annihilation of that way of the world, for virtue actually needs the way of the world to do good and to be good on a meaningful level. By paragraph 387, we find more ironic still is the revelation that the reality of the way of the world can accomplish far more good than the idealism of virtue precisely because it is freed up from the need to elevate any pre-given ideal to the status of an enduring and absolutely sacred content, to use Hegel's own phrase. Freed from the chivalrous constraints which the knight had to abide by, it can take risks and endure losses with an overall net gain in terms of practical benefits. For that matter, it becomes ever more questionable whether even the knight himself really does live up to his own criteria, for one might be reminded that as soon as he transforms that sacred ideal of virtue into a concrete act in the real world, he too inevitably becomes self-interested, much like the law of heart which is no longer law of heart after one acts on it that you saw in the last video. By paragraph 390, we find that the empty praise of virtue, defined as something so a hopelessly abstract as to be impossible to actualize in reality is not real virtue at all, for in the ancient world virtue was always understood to be something real. More ironic still is the revelation that the knight's abstract virtue, which cannot perform the good as a concrete act in the real world, only really serves one purpose, and that is to minister to men's vanity. But wait a minute, that is by far the purest and worst form of self-interest. Hegel closes a paragraph 390, in fact, by calling such virtue an empty rhetoric which is only used to boost one's ego. In other words, this virtue is itself identical to vice. By paragraph 391, Unable to carry on with this illusion any further, consciousness drops like a discarded cloak its idea of a good that exists only in principle, but has as yet no actual existence, to use Hegel's own wording. With this distortion finally removed, it suddenly recognizes that the way of the world is not quite as bad as it looked, for its reality is the reality of the universal. No longer do we seek to do good through sacrificing the individual, for this individual is required to actualize what before could exist only in principle.
In conclusion, any idea of a good in itself vanishes after being exposed as a dead end that leads nowhere. The good must be that which is made real in action and in society. Hence, the romance of reason finally draws to a close and the next phase begins. Rather than oppose the world as Faust, Rousseau, and the Knight of Virtue all did in their own way, we now simply accept the world itself as good and recognize the good as the individual universality embodied in action. In other words, the next phase returns to the community from which Faust had exiled himself at the beginning of this triad. Stay tuned.